think he was a universalist. You know, he did because you know he's, he's he's talking about language, he's talking about translation. He says that a lot like Alan Badiou, actually, you know, that we, 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 we should overcome this idea that we have the untranslatability of language. We, you know, we fetishize the foreign, we fetishize the other, all those things. And so says Coget would agree with that. He would agree with the idea that, hey, we're all human at the end of the day and we, we, can, we can talk to each other and we're, we're not that exotic or we're not that foreign and we have similar concerns. He had a universalist bent or orientation. I'm not sure. What do you think about that? Do you think that would be fair? Yeah, I think uh, that's spot on because one of the f- most famous themes in the work of Kochev uh, is this idea of the universal and homogenous state. Um, he worked towards, like in his post-war writings, he finalized a lifelong interest in this idea of a circular discourse, uh, a sort of like a system of knowledge that encompasses, I mean, it it sounds horrible. It sounds like the dream of a totalitarian reason, Uh, the allegation of pan-logicism that we throw at Hegel or was thrown at Hegel at a certain time, or this idea of like us enabled to reconcile ourselves with Hegel's philosophy and absolute spirit, quote unquote. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why he was um, sort of, um, he. Um, that's, that's another issue we need probably to discuss later on is this uh, idea that persisted for quite a long time, and I think uh, recent scholarship is moving away from that idea that he was, you know, a ventriloquist of Hegel. Well, you say this, don't you, in one of your articles, he does a violent interpretation of uh, of Hegel, which is a nice way of putting it, because it's, it's, it's a very idiosyncratic version of Hegel that he does. Yeah, that's true. And uh, on the subject of what you call universalism, he was born in Moscow. He studied in Heidelberg and Berlin. He traveled extensively uh, when he became a diplomat, a high uh, ranking, um, you know, diplomat. Um, another fascinating chapter in his life. One of the, I think one of the most interesting things that happened in his philosophy is that he was well grounded in Western philosophy. But uh, if we pay close attention, and again, this is another strand in recent scholarship on his work, he brings in what he calls Eastern philosophy into the mix. And he studied with Jaspers, and I think Jaspers as well. At one Carl point. Jaspers, yeah. Yeah, exactly. He uh, turned his attention as part of his philosophical project to the so-called Eastern philosophies. But Kozhev, I think, is, as you called him, a universalist in that sense, that he tried to bridge the gap between Eastern and Western philosophy. He also tried, and he's very good at it, uh, to bridge the gap between what we call today continental and analytic traditions, especially the post-war Kozhev. He's very close, actually, to the analytic tradition. Uh, his return uh, or turn, well, actually, he's always been a Kantian. That's another thing. That's that's the bit. That's your hobby horse, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. He he was a Kantian at the start. He well, so was Hegel, I think, in a way. If you could... So if we look at the context in which he developed his teaching in France at the start of the 1930s, because I think he came to France uh, around 1926 and he settled there. I, I really want to talk about his biography because he's got such an interesting one. Usually I tend to avoid this question, but it is just unavoidable in Kozhev. Where did he come from in first? Is he, is he Russian originally? I, I'm just... So, so, so Kozhev's biography, um, our understanding of Kozhev has evolved over uh, many decades. And our first contact, uh, and I'm talking uh, in the context of French scholarship about Kozhev, uh, also, uh, the scholarship about his work in North America, and there he has a large fan base of bureaucrats and civil servants who 
in Canada are fascinated with his work. Uh, actually, the, uh, probably worth mentioning that interest in Kozhev's work is not limited to academia. And probably the most interesting work done in conversation with his uh, intellectual legacy, it actually comes from people working outside academia or on the margins of academic philosophy. So early uh, contact with Kozhev's work actually focused a lot on his biography and the early 90s biography by uh, a very mysterious, actually, person in his own right, Dominique Offray, and then later on, Mark Filoni and a few more sequels now. Uh, there is actually, a, I'll ha this is what I call, by the way, uh, not necessarily in a negative way. I call it biographical fetishism in the case of Coget. But it is relevant. It's extremely relevant. And I think Coget himself has a hand in building, creating that portrait, that in shrouding maybe himself in some form. Right, he was quite enigmatic, wasn't he? So that was deliberately cultivated, do you think? I'll tell you a few chapters from this oh, yes, page. I can I'll get some Kozhev gossip, I like it. <laughs> oh my goodness, there's a lot of gossip and uh, some interesting things uh, emerging now. So so if you, if you try to sketch out his biography, it would make you think of a character from a novel, um, a mm -hmm. personnage de roman. Like. Yeah, like a spy novel. Yeah, it's very, uh, yeah, <laughs> the spy part. Again, that's uh, a very interesting twist mm. in the story. Yes. Well, he was Russian, was he? Is, am I right in saying that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So he was born in Moscow, uh, 1902, although some people think that's not the exact date. <laughs> he was born to a uh, fairly well-off Family. He was a nephew of Kandinsky, is that right? Exactly. So yeah. this the is Kandinsky, the artist. Yeah. This is the part, Patrick, where we start the name dropping, because you can't talk about Kozhev without name dropping. Uh, so here we go. Let's, let's do it. So when you think of uh, like the trajectory, if if you uh, summarize his entire life between 1902 and 1968, a very strange moment he picked up to pass away. I, I should be saying that. But uh, it's just the circumstances. When you think this is a man, the first detail from his biography is him. So you have to picture this, right? Him, take one, right? Opening scene, a 15, 16 year old in the Bolshevik prison, held there because he was caught up selling, I think, soap on the black market. What an industrious young man, very entrepreneurial. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fast forward to final chapter, a high ranking, highly, highly respected, very authoritative figure in the French Fifth Republic in Brussels, discussing some details of the common market and arguing against the delegation, the Dutch delegation, that if they want to apply preferential tariffs, they'll have to do it unanimously and blah. And then he drops dead. In 1968, was that before May or after? So it was in June, I think June 4th. So he saw a bit of the May 68 revolution, that's what I'm hoping to get us. So in between, in between, he managed to smuggle with Josh Vita, I think he's, um, I hope I'm remembering the names right, uh, who actually became well-known uh, film producer in his own right of expressionist films, I think. And uh, they smuggled some jewellery because his stepfather was uh, a well-off uh, jeweller who died apparently uh, during the uh, Bolshevik revolution defending his farmhouse. So they smuggled that Le Magot, those jewellery, and I think they crossed to Poland and then uh, they, were, they were held in prison, suspected for being Bolshevik spies. They managed to get out of prison and then he started his student life first in, uh, I think, Heidelberg, 
and he studied again when you look at his biography is the who's who of neo-Kantianism and Eastern philosophy, basically. And then he went to Berlin to complete his dissertation on um, Stolowiev, uh, again, a, a very important name in uh, Russian philosophy, uh, with Jaspers. And once he finished his degree, he settled, I think, in Paris. And interestingly, he probably had no intention to uh, become uh, an academic or to do any teaching. So he did some ghostwriting. And I think he had enough money at the time to live an easygoing life. There are images from that time where you could see he was surrounded by, uh, you know, uh, friends enjoying themselves in Paris. So was he of an arist aristocratic background or sort of high bourgeoisie? Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, some biographers describe that background as an aristocratic background, but apparently he has uh, or his family has high friends and he ma they managed to get him out of prison. Always handy. Yeah, always handy. Um, uh, actually, his niece says that he probably was radicalized as she says uh, she describes it uh, when when he was in the Bolshevik prison at such a young age and I've seen recently but I can't talk about them in any details because um, I don't have the name at hand but uh, I think there is a Russian philosopher who uh, was in prison at that time and uh, there are some details about that period of but anyway at uh, I think he invested some of his money in La Vache Kiri and sorry what is what What's the translation of that, Hager? So it's a type of cheese. Uh, it still exists. The brand still exists. And he embraced a free market is what you're saying, basically. Very enterprising. And uh, he lost all his money in uh, the financial uh, crash of 29. And then he tried to get his German uh, thesis acknowledged uh, and probably considered going into French academia via uh, his mentor and friend, Goyre. Uh, I think some people pronounce it Quare, uh, again, another important philosopher in his own right. He met Coiré because apparently he, he uh, this is in the biography, he, he seduced uh, the sister-in-law of Coiré and Coiré was sent to meet this young man. He, he was 10 <laughs> years, yeah, he was 10 years younger than Cécile Choutard. And when Coiré met this mysterious young man who stole his sister-in-law, he just you know, came back home and he was asked, oh, so, so you look happy. Uh, so did you manage to convince him to leave this woman alone? And he said, no, 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 no. Actually, he's much better than uh, my uh, brother-in-law. So uh, I'm happy for him to keep her. That's the moment I want to, yeah, I want to talk to you about his philosophical side, but I still have a couple of biographical questions I want to ask because he's so interesting. Now, the rumours are he was a spy or a KGB informer, depending on who you ask, obviously. Mm -hmm. How true is that? Or, or can we actually, do we have enough information, Hager, to determine the veracity of those claims or those rumours? Well, these rumours have been floated around for quite a while. Um, and some biographers suggest that this was suggested even uh, in his lifetime. Um, and uh, because... Uh, but but things actually um, sort of put Kojev on the spot with the uh, I think the publication of smuggled material from the KGB archives and interestingly one of the earliest references to this uh, allegation was published in in the British uh, tabloid. <laughs> because there is a mention of a white philosopher in the archives and based on the description and uh, because he, he he had a very kind of imposing physical appearance so some connections were made and then the french tabloid picked that that up and there has been pieces of information emerging about those allegations each time something is published it gets a lot of attention and you have his biographer, for example, Dominique Offray, emerging from his silence and saying, no, this cannot be true. 
So we're talking 1990s, also at the start of the current century. I think the most recent allegations, 2008, because a retired uh, high-ranking official in the French intelligence service, uh, I think his name is Raymond Nart, published his, uh, I think, biography, and I think he was tasked with following Cogev around. He doesn't draw any conclusions, but he says that in the process of following Cogev around and trying to learn about his life, he taught himself uh, Hegelian philosophy. That's interesting for an intelligence. That's one way of going about it, I guess. At least, at least he got something it's out commitment. of it. Commitment. Yeah, go yeah. marks for commitment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But uh, there is nothing confirmed. To, uh, and there, I mean, it's not just these uh, spy allegations. I think Kojev would find these entertaining, but there is also i suppose it depends on the extent of a spy as well like when we think spy we automatically think like i don't know james bond or something like that it could have been like it could have been like a banal if he was it could have been banal stenography basically you know quite interesting that he i mean at, at uh, after the second world war he left uh, philosoph uh, academic philosophy behind. He decided that he doesn't want to go back to teaching. He has no interest in that. And he always says, I'm not interested in philosophers. I'm looking for wise men. Les philosophes ne m'intéressent pas. So, oh, uh, they all say that, though, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> but, That's why uh, they're to start with Socrates. Exactly. And uh, he transitioned to uh, bureaucracy. And that's fascinating. And that's always been a puzzle to his biographers. How can a philosopher turn into a high ranking diplomat discussing trade? I don't know, mm. negotiating French, France's position for the Marshall Plan. Oh, you're really influential. Yeah, I meant to say this to you, like he's kind of a subterranean influence in a variety of uh, fields. He's a huge subterranean influence in philosophy. Tons of people will not have heard of Kojev, but he is really, really influential. All sorts of the major ph philosophers of the 20th century are indebted to him or are indebted to him because they disagree with him. And uh, he's also, you know, he's contributing to the foundation. Well, maybe you could tell us about this, his role with the European Union. Well, not the European Union, the... He's he's an architect in that in his you know you, I know you say in your research that there's no sort of real comprehensive study of Koji's role in the French administration and his foreign sort of trade diplomacy, but he is influential there. He's he's it's it's sort of widely known that he was working with um, Monet, I think it is Jean Monet, and I'd be I'd be wondering, could you tell us, could you fill that picture out a little bit? That's that's fascinating. How did he? How did he contribute to, well, the European, what was it then? It would have been the European Economic Community? Probably, no, the European, uh, it would be like General Agreement on Tariff and Trades and things like that. Well, here we go again with name dropping. He was connected. Yeah, was yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is why he is truly, well and truly, our contemporary. So, I mean, this side of his biography, this side of his life, as I said, it was a puzzle to biographers and critics of his work because his Italian biographer considered his transitioning to what they call bureaucracy as a betrayal of philosophy. Uh, he he says he abandoned the not ground. a Platonist then <laughs> yeah he abandoned the ground of philosophy. Interestingly enough, this same biographer are we allowed to mention names because the the work is out there in scholarship and it's to the public he, domain yes yeah yeah yeah. So Marco Filoni he's uh, a really really nice person. I know him, um, you know, through our common interest in Kojev. He actually revised his position recently and published another, uh, like a sequel to his uh, Le Philosophe du Dimanche, the philosopher of uh, the Sunday philosopher. Uh, although there is something tricky about that title, uh, because in French, uh, to call someone uh, a Sunday philosopher, something is like, mm, that's not serious. But anyway, um, he, he kind of um, revised his earlier claims and positions and published a new volume, actually a sequel to that biography, saying to what extent that part of Kojev's 
work was not truly the puzzle that we thought it was at the start and that it coheres perfectly well with his philosophical position. Um, so, so I think there is a lesson for all of us here in his biography, but also in this difficult, difficult negotiate. Like, how do we negotiate? This this concerns all of us uh, actually, whether we are in academia or outside academia. It's like um, it's what we call in current managerial. Uh, language, knowledge exchange, and knowledge transfer. Yeah, he's not the first philosopher diplomat either, uh, Eger. No, like Machiavelli springs to mind, obviously. Exactly, one of the most successful ones. Because I don't know. Uh, I mean, Raymond Aron, perhaps well known in sociology, some. But Raymond Aron also worked in uh, French bureaucracy, and he was more or less at one point in the same circles as. Kojev with his bosses. So I'll come to to his to, to name a few of his bosses. Like every single person directly connected with Kojev um, in uh, when he when he was working in, in Brussels, um, I guess. Yeah, there's Brussels, but uh, I think it's also directly connected with the French Ministry of Foreign Trade and Foreign Affairs as well. So trade. And foreign affairs, uh, I think it's Quai d'Orsay, or uh, so there are names, recognizable names for these big organizations and um, sorry, ministries. And he was in essentially when when he first joined French administration, I think around 1945, he was introduced via one of one of his students, um, I think it was Robert Marjolin. And so he introduced him to political economy and he found a post for him. Now, here's the interesting part. That post, uh, and this is a challenge to people studying his biography, studying his work, because there is a, a lot of interest in his administrative work in the context. And this is where a huge amount of scholarship is being generated in the context of the crisis of the idea of Europe. People keep coming back to Kojev. And actually, there is an interesting, actually, um, very interesting, very exhaustive, uh, I think in three or four volumes, um, historical uh, book on the history of the European Union uh, from the common market as it evolved, etc. And it mentions Kojev's memoranda to high-ranking uh, officials in the French Fourth and Fifth Republic. And actually, the Fifth Republic is still ongoing. So I asked, uh, his, his name escapes me now, I, I corresponded with the author, the historian, and I asked him, oh, you mentioned Kojev a lot, and it looks like you went into diplomatic archives and you found this amazing memoranda telling high-ranking officials do this and do don't do that this is what you need to tell you know the english this is what you need to tell the germans this is what needs to happen in our negotiation with this or that party and and i i was surprised when he replied and said uh, actually i'm i'm not sure i know exactly who kojev is like i wasn't even aware that he's important in philosophy as far as i'm concerned he's just part of the story of the formation of the eu for that particular author exactly so so there are very important people who um sadly they all passed away now and i think i've got some some of the early research that was conducted on kojev's diplomatic career I'd, I'd, I'd rather call it that than bureaucratic and i think there are uh, some testimonials which are extremely extremely interesting so i think clapier uh, bernard clapier and all of these people are the who's who in the french fourth fifth republic they all went on to become you know like director of um i don't know uh, the bank of france and um ambassadors of in China. Very senior French civil servants. Very senior French civil servants, exactly. And one of the things Clapier said, very interesting, he said when he first joined, like no one knew that he was a philosopher, but we were all intrigued. 
they all say exactly the same thing. It's like, this man is extremely intriguing. We don't know why, because here's what he, he does. Initially, he had a post as a translator because he had knowledge of so many, you know, languages. And then by, I would say the mid fifties, like from the mid fifties till his death in 1968, many uh, first-hand witnesses who basically people who worked with him in French administration, they testified and they said, this man had a major role in key foreign policies um, in France throughout that period. And he came up with visionary ideas. So what were like his role evolved from Cochet the translator to actually he said, okay, so he was very respectful of the administrative hierarchy. He was not a bully, although his knowledge is clearly like it surpasses the knowledge. He was so good with arguments, with uh, negotiations, and he would convince anybody he talks to about like very persuasive. He's charismatic, yeah. Ex exactly. And they said, although like during the day, he would not try to talk over people. He would not try to belittle them, although he these this comes word for word from Clapier's rendition of um, and, and he says, however, however, in the evenings when everybody's work is done, they actually go to the bar, etc. They have a beer and he sits down with very influential people and literally he tells them what they need to do. At the time, the role perhaps comes very, I mean, it comes very close to what we call like advisory role or some element of political PR. But what he was doing back then, we're talking early 50s, many uh, high ranking civil servants said, we've never heard of this role before. We didn't know what it was because he would sit us down and he would convince us this is what we need to do and this is what we need to say when we are in official delegations discussing very important things. So he's a strategist, a political strategist. I like that. I'll go for that. <laughs> yes, a political strategist. And uh, some testimonials uh, say this is this is coming from uh, Wormser, for example. There's, he also worked like some of his bosses, uh, Jean-Pierre Brumet. Jean-Pierre Brumet was ambassador to London, to Japan, uh, I think Germany, also Edgar Faure. So uh, it's really the who's who of French uh, high administration uh, in the Fourth and Fifth Republic. But the the other hidden part of all this, and this is... Uh, there is takes, a lot of hidden parts. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> very, very esoteric, yeah. Yes. Uh, is that, you know, the notion of authority. Uh, yeah, this is your translation, the, the book that you translated, yeah. It, it wasn't written as a book. It was written and addressed among, like, um, uh, this, this. Is it like a, is it like a manual, Hager? A manual of political strategy, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And the addressee of, um, you know, and some correspondence in Kojev's archives, uh, tells us uh, who he sent this to, this manuscript to, was actually someone, and this is the controversial part, who was working at the time as a high-ranking civil servant in the Vichy government. So this is tricky. Well, this is something I meant to ask you. What was his role? What was he doing during the war in France? You know, how much did he participate, say, in uh, the French resistance? for example. The biographers demonstrated through first-hand uh, testimonials that he was an active member of the French resistance. How active? As in, you know, I mean, Beck Beckett was in the French resistance, but he contributed, he contributed in his, his unique way, you know. I mean, was he was he was he was he militarily involved? Was he blowing up, t t you know, uh, t train lines and the like, or sabotage? No, actually, he did not 
he 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 was stationed somewhere. There's a very intriguing photograph uh, of him with uh, a group of uh, fellow officials, and um, yeah, they were ho- holding a broom. One of them was holding a broom, for example, instead of a of a of a rifle or something like that. But there is there is he he was there. Um, the kind of work he did, we don't have a lot of information about it, but the little of information we have, um, I think it was a work, again, as you called it, of a strategist, of someone who writes pamphlets, uh, someone who writes uh, anti German propaganda. And um, I think one of these. Uh, uh, pamphlets emerged recently. It's written in German. It's trying to explain to the German people and under the Nazi re- regime at the time that it's not. It's 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 a very intriguing piece. It's not nothing though. It's not it's not nothing, Hager. You know, it's in the context of uh, Vichy and uh, Nazi occupation. I mean, I don't mean to. What I said when I talked about Beckett and his contributions. I mean, I don't mean to minimize it. That's that's enough to get you killed, like. In those days. He he moved to Marseille during you know the uh, he left Paris and moved to Marseille and uh, I think the work of uh, the resistance I, I mean there 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 are some uh, important historical events that do not involve Kojev directly but we know of like we know what happened at the time and uh, there was you know uh, a strong anti-semitic sort of there were some horrifying things that um, took place precisely very close to where uh, Kojev moved and I think someone suggested that he was even considering uh, migrating to uh, the United States but he was writing these uh, strategic, uh, you know, pieces, uh, outline of a phenomenology of right is also part of those um, texts that were aimed to be read that were not there for public consumption. You know, Sartre was right, writing things for, you know, and he's always sneered at Sartre's fame, by the way. He wrote things which were circulated among uh, an influential group of people. Many of them actually were uh, civil servants in the Vichy, under the Vichy regime. But historical accounts, there are historians who argue that the civil servants who transitioned, you know, to the Fourth Republic and perhaps even to the Fifth Republic were not necessarily Vichyists. Uh, I had this argument with one of my um, Koshevian uh, friends who were a little bit embarrassed to talk about, like, uh, they're always, like, driven by this suspicion. There's something not quite right with Koshev. Was he uh, trying to hedge uh, his bets, so to speak? Like, oh, where's the war going? I'm going to side with the winner. And some people make these suggestions, but I think if we read, for example, the notion of authority, but also the outline of a phenomenology of right, and he's another famous piece. On tyranny? Yeah, on tyranny, in conversation with Strauss, but also uh, the so-called Latin Empire, uh, which is a piece, again, that he wrote right before, I think, uh, parts, drafts of it, right before the end of the Second World War, which he ambitiously called Project Gojevnikov. And it was outlining the new world order after the end of the war. So coming back to the uh, high ranking civil servants and uh, ministers, uh, actually some of his bosses became prime ministers uh, in the French Fifth Republic, uh, like the someone called you know, described as a radical French politician, Edgar Faure, who was uh, France's prime minister in 1952 and again 55, 56. Um, he, he was Kojev's boss at, at one point. When he worked with him. He knows these people. And yes, he found himself or he, he was in a position 
fascinating connections. And everybody is saying in these testimonials that he was highly respected. He was very authoritative. Ministers would listen to him. And I think uh, the question came up as to whether he had any direct contact with the God, because I think in some of the uh, playful suggestions he used to make, because that's another thing he was notorious for. Of, uh, he would call God my colleague, for example. <laughs> he refers to God, hey, my colleague, uh, le bon Dieu. Um, and and he, he boasts to some friends that he is the most important person in French politics after De Gaulle. But uh, the question came up at one point to some of the uh, these, you know, high ranking civil servants and ministers, etc. They were asked, did he have any direct contact with the God? And many of them said, we don't think so. We haven't seen anything to confirm this. However, his memoranda, his ideas, which are always described as prescient, visionary, authentic, provocative. These are the words that keep coming back. And he was, in a way, well ahead of his time in terms of provocative suggestions he was making. Like, for instance, and this is uh, the interesting part of his involvement in the tariff negotiations and taking part in big uh, political diplomatic conferences in the international stage around so-called developing countries. So we're talking mid-50s onward. Uh, he self-consciously uh, sees himself as one, determining the shape of history, of world history, and uh, he sees himself as uh, right there in the post-war period as well, being someone who is influencing world historical consciousness. Uh, and I, I know that sounds grandiose, but he actually probably is. I couldn't put it in better words. If someone... Um, is arguing, uh, let's say in the mid 50s and probably earlier, and telling, especially uh, they call them Anglo Saxon, the Anglo, <laughs> basically they refer to Britain, the United Kingdom, and I think they were strongly averse. And Kojev was a lead on this, and history books are about that period attest to that. He was described as the terror, terrifying figure, la terreur uh, de la délégation uh, anglaise. Like the English and the Americans hated him passionately. And uh, this is this comes out. This is this this is not my. Uh, these are uh, the testimonials of people who worked with him, and they said every time he walks in the room with us. So they know he is this Franco-Russian philosopher. He has no background in, he has no knowledge in economy. He is not a politician. What on earth is he doing there? And they know that he's going, uh, so to speak, to hit them with some dialect. I can see their point, to be honest with you. <laughs> you go through your day's work, you have some Hegel there, lads. Yeah. Apparently, in one of the those biographical stories, he uh, it, it is alleged that he reduced a, a very important diplomat from, I think it was either the American or the British delegation. He reduced him to ridicule. He, he used the art of dialectic, which is partly platonic as well, because in dialectic, there's what he describes as discussion. Yes, that's what it means between two tongues, yeah. Exactly. And, and his way of arguing, again, in some of the rare recordings of his last minutes, when he was arguing against the Dutch delegation, it's impressive. It's almost like he says things that reduce people to silence. It's very simple what he says. So he says, there's a limit to what we can say as human beings. He says, let's reduce the schema of any discourse to A and non-A. We can either say A or non-A. If you say, non-A and uh, if you say neither A 
uh, nor non A, you are literally reduced to silence. You can't say anything if you refute both. So what happens is that we end up saying, we end up trying to find a compromise and we say, okay, and he says it in a funny way. He says, okay, how about 90% A and 10% uh, non A, and we start, and he plays with his. I can see why people got infuriated with that. And he says we keep quantifying these things, and then we whittle it down to a position of compromise. We say, and he says it in English. He says it's fifty-fifty. He says, okay, let's <laughs> think. An apple. Someone says it's red and someone says it's green and we start fighting over that and then someone said oh okay it's a little bit green and uh, more red than green and then we come to a position of agreement and it's 50 50. and i think in the context of the cold war um this is one of the uh, things um i'm try I'm, I'm leaning towards now it sounds like game theory it's all it's all very well when you when you, when you talk about that, you know, when you talk about that in terms of like in a in a in a room uh, over a diplomatic table, but when when there's sort of trade negotiations between countries, but you know when you're talking about uh, nuclear uh, destruction, that's another matter entirely. Exactly, and 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 here there are some uh, funny stories about him trying to convince the. American delegation trade. We're, we're talking in the context of trade, and, and and it's fascinating. Like when you think, here's someone who's so erudite. He has this encyclopedic knowledge of Eastern and Western philosophies, and he actually sits down and takes trade items one by one. We're talking here, you know, details like uh, sugar, cigarettes, this that. And the probably the provocative suggestion that he's well known for in that context of his diplomatic work is that he tried to convince rich countries at the time not to tax industrial products coming from the colonies and later on uh, post-colonial, you know, independent countries. And at the time, the way it was described, it's like, sorry, what are you trying to say? Like, we're not going to tax... Uh, and there is a funny story. Well, I can see the anticipation of the European Union there, because you're, you're, you're talking there about Hager, about uh, uh, the, the free movement of trade and goods and people between countries, which is, you know, it's, you know, after Brexit, it's one of the key sort of red lines of, 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 of that. The idea of Europe... Because, I, I mean, he worked, he was really instrumental in the nascent idea of the common market. And one of his bosses was directly responsible, François Valéry, uh, not to be confused with the French, uh, if some people pop artist, François Valéry, but uh, he was a high ranking civil servant politician who worked on the Schumann plan and Kojev was directly in contact with him and and to, to basically make these kind of provocative suggestions and and most of these civil servants who worked with Kojev say that as a result of his original provocative ideas we actually managed to turn these ideas into acceptable policies by everyone. Probably worth noting uh, on the subject of Brexit and so on and so forth is that he's always written unfavorably about Britain's intention to remain in Europe because they were actually at the time against the whole idea of well, well, to be fair, I don't think de Gaulle was too hot on it either, you know. Exactly, exactly. Because his vision after the end of the Second World War uh, is that the world is going to split up in into centres of uh, political power and influence. Yeah, a multipolar world. He was trying to find a place for what Agamben picked up now and tried to call it the Latin Empire. Uh, there's like, sh where should France basically place itself? 
he worked in an almost subterranean way to bring or to right. overcome that fear of Germany. And I think this is where there is a connection between what he did with his lectures on Hegel and his diplomatic work. This idea of the appeasement rapprochement in Franco-German relations, it was almost a taboo subject at one point. In the context of academic philosophy, uh, when Kochev started talking about Hegel, that was not an easy thing to do. Right. Well, let's let's shall we shall we uh, shall we use that as an opportunity to talk about those those lectures. Uh, so uh, this is where, where I'm primarily interested in in, in Kozhev, uh, as as a lot of I suppose uh, academic scholars and philosophy are in the twentieth century and the twenty first century. <laughs> I'm a 20th, 20th century boy, I'm afraid, uh, Hager. Um, but, so, but the point is that these lectures are hugely influential. They happen in the late 30s. He's, Kozhev, at this period, he's responsible for the introduction of Hegel into French thought. And at these lectures, which are not published, but are they published posthumously, there's tons of people at them, isn't there? You know, real sort of intellectual luminaries in the French tradition. And I, I, I mean, was Sartre there? Merleau-Ponty, Lacan, Bataille? Alt- Sartre was was not there, but he knew of the lectures and yeah. he knew of the famous piece that was published in a journal called Mesure in '39, I think, which actually. Uh, introduce, which was used as the introduction to the lectures of Higo, edited by Quenot. Right, so Quenot was there, wasn't he? And Althusser, Lacan, uh, Breton. Yeah, uh, the surrealists were there, very yeah. important. Uh, there was even uh, apparently a highly decorated man in uh, a military <laughs> uniform. Uh, who would sit there and uh, Arant attended some of these lectures and there were a number, and this is the overlooked part, a number of very important Russian uh, poets, intellectuals, who left uh, basically the uh, Russian emigre in uh, Germany and uh, Paris that were familiar with, uh, with his work. So uh, now those lectures, the context, is so important because it shows to what extent Kozhev was in his own right, something, uh, I hope I'm not saying something ridiculous, um, equal to the Kantian Copernican revolution. It was a big moment. It was a big moment. It is. It was a big moment because, and I have to say, who wouldn't envy that guy for finding himself surrounded by really important minds. He was, he was, and he's influential as well. Try to communicate this to the listeners. He's influential on both the left and the right, for example. So, so like on the right, you would have, uh, I suppose, he, he has a huge influence in America, especially over thinkers like Alan Bloom, I think, and you know, some neoconservatives. And, you know, of course, the most famous one of all, Francis Fukuyama, who himself is hugely influential in our recent history. On on the left, I suppose he's uh, well, he's he's certainly influential on in Merleau Ponty, for example. I think. Well, what's interesting <laughs> that those lectures. Let's try and sort of talk about the philosophy, I guess. Hegel, like, what is he trying to do now? It's a reflection on Hegel. Uh, it's a very idiosyncratic reading of Hegel, and he kind of starts out with some very basic relation between the human being and the world. And the human being is an I, a self. And Hegel does this in the phenomenology of spirit. He says we just start with sin certainty. What makes us human, I suppose, is that we're a questioning I. And then this brings in all these kind of dualisms. And you, you talked about this already, A and non-A, but, you know, subject and object, man and nature, desire, duty, human, divine, individual, collective, general, particular, so on. All these radical dichotomies, uh, these binary opposites that Derrida would call them later. And what is he doing? He's not just saying, well, they're part of our thinking. They make our thought, but we need to we need to figure out how how they they are surpassed. What's the dialectical process, or how are these reconciled? The lectures, the introduction to the reading of Hegel, is a right. very unusual book. Um, it was published actually in Kozhev's lifetime. The actual lectures 
thousands, uh, literally, of folios. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, and, it's abbreviated. And, yeah, and, and actually, the English uh, translation uh, by Alan Bloom, uh, oh, sorry, edited by Bloom, uh, who had an interesting epistolary uh, correspondence with Gojev as well, and um, the uh, uh, the interest that um, people on the right and left, as you said, had in his work is quite fascinating. And the lectures were um, edited with his approval by Raymond Quenot. But to leave the biography aside and delve into the actual, you did describe it really well. And I think we all come to those lectures from different perspectives. Well, how do you, what do you, how do you feel about them? What do they make you, what's your, what's, what's your thoughts on their thoughts? But something happened with the lectures and the key moment in those lectures is the master-slave dialectic. It's, what is it? Section A, chapter four of the Phenomenology of Spirit. And that's the most famous part of Kojev's work. It's like these two individuals who meet each other, nothing predisposes them to, you know, be uh, a master or a slave. There is this first encounter where we want to risk our life for a non material, non-biological, sort of non-material reason. We're not fighting over, you know, something that we're going to consume or whatever um, and move on. But it's about, he reduces this, it reduces the uh, uh, reason behind that violent encounter to the desire. Yes, so the idea is, uh, Hager, that he, when we meet, he encountered the other in sort of that, in the sort of the brute immediacy of our encounter with another, whoever that other is, it's not so much we desire what they own or what they are constituted out of or their material being or even their resources. What we want is what they want. Exactly. And look, I mean, you asked me, what do I make of it? Um, the whole, like, there was a job description, like when he took on these seminars in 1933, uh, I think he was supposed to cover Coire for a year, maybe two, mm -hmm. and he carried on. Um, and there are some historical moments which, like when you read the introduction to the reading of Hegel, we also need to read it in parallel with a historical background, like what was happening in world history at the time. Like, for example, when I come to the 1937, 36, 37, lectures, uh, the lectures of that year, you can't help not thinking of the Moscow trials or, you know, of very important things that were happening across the world at that time. He was finalizing essentially his own philosophical system by pinning down two essential forms of action, um, which uh, I'd, I'd like to compare to Planck physics. And his interest actually in modern physics is uh, a, another important aspect of his work. So to, to actually reduce the basic of what human action is about to struggle and work. So we're divided into these two categories. Obviously, some people read into this a Marxist narrative of like, oh, the worker is going to prevail at one point because the master is idle and they end up in an existential impasse and the worker is transforming nature. So they create the world of technology and art and so on and so forth. And the world becomes theirs. The master becomes more and more alienated, blah, blah, blah. And they will prevail and there will be another fight the final one, but that doesn't do justice to what Kojé was saying. I think what interests, uh, what is interesting there, and there were many women actually in attendance in, in his lectures, they said we need to find that end of history in our time. And I think what, it, what impresses me about Kojé 
is not the idea of truth. And this is against those who make this allegation that he's all about this totalitarian reason, etc. No, what Kochev says on numerous occasions that what matters in contemporary thought, in philosophy and beyond, it's not the truth. It's not the truth that we need to be con to concern ourselves with. Um, not that it's not, it is important, but he says we need to pay attention to errors. So it's the element of error. And he says, look, simple examples, take the world of technology, for example. Someone dreams of flying before planes were invented. A poet says, talks about flying, etc. And people would think, oh, this is irrational. If you try that, you're going to crash. And But the day we mm -hmm. invented the technological possibilities which allow a human being to fly, he says, the poet's error became truth. So I think that to me is quite inspiring. And he applies the same logic to political action. Uh, I think and this is one of the sore points between myself and my colleagues in working on Kojev, you know, the American Canadian tradition. He, he talks about revolutionary action and that phrase literally was edited out of all Anglo-American studies on Kojev. So he applies the same logic of the poet talking about flying and technology invented, etc. Error becomes truth. Um, the inadequate discourse becomes an adequate discourse because it coincides. Dialectics. Bravo. The same applies to political action. He says, OK, so here we go. Someone says, I'm going to kill the king, obviously, figuratively, uh, in Koshev's case. I'm, I mean, uh, anyway, basically, you know, topple down uh, uh, something, a political whatever, uh, undertake, let's, let's say, I'm going to undertake a concrete political action and fight for something. So he says, and this is the provocative part, which collides with Kantian morality. And that's that's the tricky part. He says, OK, so if your action fails, you have to accept to be punished, because if you are not punished, you are not taken seriously. This is the radical part. And we all cringe at hearing that. So he says, if you are not, if you do not get a political punishment, he says, if you fail, then you will be described as a criminal and you, if you have any self-respect, you will have to accept to be treated. And here is his, I have to say, Stalinism as well. Like you have to be treated as a political opponent who failed. Um, and I don't want to say something shocking, but you get that political punishment. Right. But you can't just be sent, for example, to prison to be reformed or dismissed as like, oh, this is nothing. Um, but if you succeed, then you be you will be hailed as. So, again, the dialectic of error and truth, if you apply it to uh, the context of political action, what do you get? There is no ideology really driving anything. Um, I think that's that's the thing that is speaking to us today. But isn't that what, yeah, so I get that, that's why you're alluding to the end of history and who are the political figures that we talk about as the end of history. Usually it's uh, people who are influenced by the likes of Francis Fukuyama, so you're talking about people like Tony Blair and Bill Clinton and Third Wayism, and what are they? Their politics is non-ideological, it's self-consciously non-ideological. The idea is that we have to get rid of ideology because ideology is some kind of theoretical abstraction which stands outside history and is at worst an embarrassment and at best uh, ends up in the gulag. I think Kojev is challenging us, and, th and this is the part of his work that has, l I mean, for such a long time uh, has been described uh, in all critiques of his work as mere play. Uh, until very recently, Jeff Love's uh, The Black Circle, uh, 
talks about Kochev's nihilism and his Eastern fascination with suicide and whatever. I think what's what um, maybe needs to be said about Kochev's post-war writings is where he moved beyond the question of action because in his work there is this dialect there is a fully rounded philosophy of action let's say the lectures were concerned about that and then post-war writings were about the other side of our human existence which is discourse because we are not just action we are discourse so and this is where the major bulk of his work becomes super challenging and very topical and very pertinent in the context of so-called post-truth societies, in the context of post-Trump, post-Brexit, so on and so forth. It's, I mean, uh, perhaps we need to listen to a very simple story because Gojev is, is such a good storyteller and he gets our attention when he tells us simple stories and the simple story he says is that i come back to this a and non a right you can either say a or non a right so if you say it's not a and it's not non a so you find yourself talking about the ineffable mm -hmm. and and he says this is where le bon dieu uh, good god emerges always from these either the ineffable, but le bon Dieu, it, he emerges, well, it becomes a tag name for lots of things, right? Um, from, and this is the key word, is contradiction. And he spells it in an, he, he writes it in an interesting way. Contra and diction, as in you're saying that you're, speaking we're talking but we're contradicting ourselves and when we contradict ourselves we are actually not talking and he says this is why many people are silent or don't say much and they don't know it because they contradict themselves so this 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 idea of like making sure that we say something that makes sense what makes sense, um, and this is the provocative part, which takes us back to the lectures on Hegel. In order to make sense, something needs to end. Like you cannot make sense about something that doesn't have an end. And what doesn't like, and, and there is an interesting example in uh, one of the manuscripts, post-war writings, manuscript, which is not available in the post post posthumously published work uh, where he writes and it's well known in analytic philosophy actually so he writes a sentence and he keeps like it starts with a couple of words and then adds another word to it and another word but there is no full stop and he says look here the meaning is not complete so it's not really a sentence so it and so so th this this idea of like paying attention to what we say and his taxonomy of discourse and he divides discourse into uh, three types of discourse, prayer, order or commandment. And, and he explains uh, in, you know, through his analysis of the history of philosophy that what we were trying to do uh, in the course of that history of philosophy um, is to basically understand how time equals concept. And uh, I'm trying to sound, I'm starting to sound a little bit obscure here because I'm I'm skipping so many. Let's let's uh, we can. I'd like to talk about that actually. And I'm I'm just conscious uh, that I've I've taken up a lot of your time now, Hager. But uh, so I've got a couple of more questions. So um, let's try and maybe get time into concept in there. And um, what, what as well, <laughs> one of the things uh, you know when you're talking about you know discourse and that. Very, very 
concrete philosopher. I know he's doing quite what sounds like looks like quite abstract Hegelian philosophy, but there is a sense that makes universal sense what he's talking about. He's talking about desire. You know, desire is the motive power of history. We have uh, all humans have a desire for recognition, a desire to feel valid, to have worth, and sometimes that that will in- invariably involve wanting what other people want. That and that's you know we have that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not a good nor bad. A desire carries this struggle for a satisfaction of needs. But of course, then for for this is his big point, isn't it? In the in the lectures on Hegel, it, desire carries its own suspension. So your desire, you know, when you uh, when you attain something. It's gone, and then you transform yourself, and that then brings us into these sort of themes of like, well, the, the, the time and the idea of negation and neg- negativity. He borrows a little from Heidegger here. He, he's saying that Hegel is one of the first philosophers, one of the first great philosophers, to under- understand that the concept, what Hegel calls the concept, is time itself. You know, there's, it's as Hegel calls it this. And I think it's the philosophy of right. You know, uh, time thinking itself is the, the activity of philosophy. So what we need to do is understand our historical positioning our historical society and how we become aware of that you know time is well what the human being is is as you say it's action and it's negation and it negates our our natural being our material being but it's also understanding ourselves as temporal beings with a temporal horizon that simple fact is key to understanding for example his ontology the question of being and you mentioned Heidegger and he has many sort of reservations um, in regard to Heidegger's philosophical project and he in his post-war writing he even says Heidegger went wrong sadly he went wrong and why did he go wrong Um, This is an interesting way of understanding how Kochev schematizes, periodizes what he calls a logical scheme of the history of philosophy, because there's the chronological evolution of uh, the concept um, and the introduction of the concept in time and time in the concept. So we move from a notion of the concept related to the eternal, to eternity, to temporality, and you get all the skeptics, um, to the eternal in time or outside time, until we come to that perfect equation. And for anybody who has interest, probably in Kojev or exploring this link, and maybe I can use this podcast as a platform. Please yeah, do. something out there, actually. Um, my wildest dream is to have uh, some uh, collaborative work with um, people who have interest in physics and also people with interest in all aspects like psychology, psychoanalysis, etc. Because underpinning a lot of what Kojev is writing is his claim that, I know all this may sound technical, but it's like, this is intriguing. How do we understand physical reality at any particular point in our human history? How do we define objective reality? That's the concept, right, for Hegel, isn't it? Yeah, that's what that's what Kojev means. So for the listeners, that he means objective reality. It becomes sort of temporalized in the lectures on Hegel. Sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah. and and he has some very simple analogies to this. Um, um, he says there's a wall, okay, in front of you. You try to go through the wall, right, and you bump your head against. You try, but you can talk about you physically you know, going through the wall, in poetry, in fiction, whatever. So objective reality, it doesn't pose a serious problem to what we say, but it actually poses a serious problem when we try to, you know, to to change it, to, it it resists. So the theme of the read uh, that, Um, objective reality is constituted through an interaction between 
um, the object of the experiment and the experimenter. So in a sense, a knowing um, I or, you know, who can understand the reality they're abstracted from, you know, and there's for Kojev also the subject of common sense. We need to a, a kind of go back and emphasize the idea of the discontinuous or the principle of discontinuity. A synthesis, didn't he? Isn't that what the, sort of the lectures on Hegel are? It's not Marxist. I think you're right at that. It's not like a pure free market capitalism. And I mean, and, and I might be putting this in very simplistic terms, and perhaps we should probably end with this might be a good place to end. He's, he's, it's very much a book about freedom, and it's very much a book about mutual reconciliation and equal recognition of all. And he's trying to perform the synthesis of, well, capitalism and socialism. So the EU, basically. <laughs> it's a philosophy that speaks to all of us. It's not an ex exclusive philosophy. It's a philosophy that speaks possibly to people at different stages in their lives. Um, and they come to Koje from so many different angles, so many different disciplines, so many different interests. I think it's a book that puts the human being at the center of the story. But it, it, it's not a narrative that demonizes the human being. But it, the human being is at the center of the story, but also at the center of the story as one element in an integral whole that is not human as well. Something that is beyond us in the sense of something that comes, uh, I mean, in a literal sense that survives us. I think what it, what is empowering in the case of Kojev is like, he gives you a sense of agency over the world, like the world you live in. It's not a world that you look at as an observant or he, he had a problem with people who are there to contemplate things or to moan about things. <laughs> Probably a good place to finish. I think I got to, I got to, we need to stop there because I've, I've taken up so much of your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hager. Thank you okay. for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Uh...